graduated with a, a degree in chemistry uh, from UCL. That was about four years ago now, uh, 2016. So I came back to Singapore uh, with my degree in chemistry uh, and I started working uh, in, in research. So, you know, we, we were making chemicals from other chemicals. Uh, I think uh, and it was during that, that, that process that, that I was thinking back about my uh, uni days in, in, in London. So, you know, um, as any student studying abroad can, can attest, uh, you generally have to cook for yourself one way or another because, you know, buying out, eating out is quite cost prohibitive, mm. especially so in, in, in London. Uh, and so I was thinking back to, to my time there when, when I was trying to, you know, as I was cooking uh, for myself, I would find ways to, you know, apply my chemistry knowledge in, in food, see how we can, see how I could, uh, you know, cook better using, uh, using science, use, using food science. Uh, so, so when I was working in, in, in my R&D lab, you know, that was, what, that was, that was a question that I, I was constantly trying to explore as well. Like, how can I take, you know, my learning points from research and bring it into, uh, you know, kitchens and bars when I, when I consult with them. And that sort, that sort of started, uh, got me started on, on this whole, uh, you know, exploration, exploratory journey of, of into, into, into F&B in, in Singapore. Yeah. Uh, and then, so after my, my one year stint in, you know, organic chemistry, I moved to a biosynthesis laboratory. Uh, so over there, they would, you know, make chemicals, but they will make it from microbes or uh, microorganisms via fermentation. So it, it was a bit more, uh, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was a bit more skewed or, or targeted towards, you know, the F&B market, the nutritional market, the consumer care, uh, skincare uh, industry, because the ingredients used or the, the processes used were generally uh, industrially accepted to be to be safe for for human contact human use. Uh, so yeah, so you know, so I moved from from chemistry into biosynthesis in, into uh, bioprocessing fermentation, and then that's when I really started to see how uh, you know the, the the whole kit, the scientific technological toolbox, can be used in in a kitchen, and that's when I really started to play with you know sauerkrauts. I started playing with with uh, kombucha, uh, uh, I was playing with tempeh for a while as, as well. Um, and yeah, so that, that that's, that's, that's a bit about how I got here. Uh, and along the way, you know, I, I was talking to, to chefs, I was talking to bartenders, I was talking to baristas, I found out that while people really want to, to, to learn more, they, they, they really like this, this um, topic, not everyone is, is well equipped with the know-how to, to tackle these problems. And that was when I, I saw that, you know, I was in this very unique position uh, with my scientific background on one hand and my culinary interests on another, uh, that I could sort of marry the two together and, and be able to, to share something uh, with, with both sides. Uh, and then, so I started doing, uh, you know, consult consultation projects uh, with Mission Start uh, Lab Rim, with um, Asia's 50 Best Bar, Gibson, uh, so we started teaching uh, workshops at Dong Baru Hawk Center. Uh, so really, really, really the point was to not just to, you know, cut and paste information from our tutorials, from our lectures, from our textbooks, but um, to distill the information in a way that was accessible by most people. So, you know, if you are a lay person, uh, if you're interested in food, you can, you, you know, you could sit down, you could listen to a, a, a a talk and uh, hopefully walk away with a bit more knowledge about you know how food works, how fermentation works, and and, and how you could ferment food back at home. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, are there, there follow-up questions? Yeah. Uh... So everyone, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat and, or if you would like to um, speak, you can also use the raise hand function. I think it's, uh, or you can use the reaction, I guess, if you just use a thumbs up or something. Trevon, is that a good idea? 
like just to basically get our attention so we can pause for you to to speak um i actually i think that a lot of times people are not uh uh are hesitant to try their own fermentation uh, is because of food safety issue. So do you have a sense of how that can be addressed or how, you know, like you're saying that you want this to be accessible to lay people, but you know, like I've been trying my own fermentation and uh, I enjoy the process, you know, it's, it's really creating a culture and also your gut, gut culture. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm still alive and well and kicking and happy. So I just wonder, like, you know, what are some of the things that we should look out for? I think, you know, it, it really depends on, on what you want to, to ferment. Mm. Uh, and I think it's important that we understand, you know, how fermentation works. And the way I see it uh, is fermentation is essentially any other cooking technique. Right, so in the kitchen, conventionally, you would, you know, you would boil something, you would steam something, you would fry something. Uh, so these processes at use heat, right? They use an increase in temperature to transform raw ingredients into cooked food. Fermentation is similar, uh, but we call it almost like a, a non-thermal process. So instead of using heat, we use microbes. So the, the microbes will, will act on the, on these raw ingredients and, and make them you know, cooked or in a, in a way, uh, make them edible. Uh, so, and of course, when you, when you steam something, when you boil something, when you fry something, you use different indicators to assess whether something is, you know, completely steamed, whether something is completely fried. Uh, and fermentation that, that's very, that's, that's, uh, there's, there's almost that direct comparison as well. So if you are doing a, a lactic acid fermentation as in, you know, pickles, as in kimchi, as in sauerkraut, uh, there is a certain measure for that. If you're making beer, if you're making cider, if you're making wines, there's also not, not a, it's a different sort of measure. Uh, so, and you're making tempeh, it's an entirely different uh, yardstick. So it really all depends on, on what you want to ferment. So there, there's no one way to assess fermentation. So when we look at safety, for example, uh, the way you assess the, the safety of tempeh is different from how you assess the safety of of kimchi or, or, or sauerkraut. Uh, so, but you know, in, in industry uh, where, where I work, we use uh, visual indicators, we use the measurements, we use, uh, we use pH, um, we use, you know, smell, we can taste it sometimes. Uh, and of course, a lot, a lot of it um, mm -hmm. comes into, you know, uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of it really, really taps into, into experience and, and, and expertise uh, because it's something that, that we are quite familiar with uh, we, we handle on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah, so it, it really depends on, on, what, on, mm. on what you want to ferment. Um, I think in general, you know, when we, so we, when we teach workshops, we try to uh, make sure that people are able to replicate some of these things at home, right? So we, we don't want them to um, be certain of, of, certain of some aspects in the class and then, and then go back home and, and then feel completely lost. Uh, so we try to put, you know, try to, to include certain photos, certain images, so that sort of helps people to keep track. So if something looks okay, it may be okay. If something looks a bit off, then that is also a very good telltale sign that, you know, there may be something, uh, there may be an issue there. Um, one, thing that, one thing that we have tried to do is to curate a, a local fermentation community. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, over there we have we have people who you know post photos, ask questions, uh, and we still have that have this community where people can can troubleshoot uh, issues. They can publish successful recipes. They can talk about uh, you know what works and what doesn't work, and and, and we want to make it uh, a really really a uh, a group where people can learn uh, together. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that 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 helps. I think we think that you know. Sometimes if, if you're brewing or you're fermenting alone, you're not too sure or something, but when you, know, when, when you have a community or when you have friends that you can bounce ideas off um, or when, you know, people who can sort of check your work in, in, in a way, uh, I, think, I think that, that makes it a lot, uh, a lot more accessible. So I, my, I have a follow-up question, which is like, um, do you actually like do tests of your 
government uh, or it's really like what I personally feel uh, uh, inspired by is that you are saying that we will taste it, we will smell it and it's like this kind of like tools and equipment and uh, ability that all of us already possessed, right? So, um, and how that fermentation is a process that is accessible therefore to, to anybody um, who wants to get into it. But I also wonder that because you have a scientific background, do you uh, do any test? Uh, you know, like how the scientific background come from your body? So it's already proof, it's already science, you know. So uh, we, we do have, have tests um, in the pipeline. So we are currently trying to build capacity to handle uh, this kind of test. The, 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 the challenge with tests is that um, the challenge with or rather the challenge with prescribing tests to everyone is that um, you know in science more often than not you get answers to the questions that you ask. So if you don't ask the right questions, you get answers that don't really add value to what you're doing. Uh, so in what we do, we are, we are very careful about asking the right questions. We are very careful about looking at answers that give us meaningful inf information. Uh, so so we, we do have tests that, we, that we're looking to run, uh, you know, whether it's microbiology, whether we're looking at um, metabolites, whether we're looking at uh, certain secondary or, or, or proxy characteristics to, to, to measure. Um, yeah, so there are, you know, there's a host of, or, or battery of tests that you can do, uh, but you always want to make sure that you, yeah, you, you ask the right question. And that, that's something that, that we can see um, out there in, in the industry, when we look at home brewers, home fermenters, um, a lot of them are throwing numbers all around, but they don't always know what these, what these numbers mean. And I think that can undermine sort of that scientific education that we've been trying to, uh, to, to, to cultivate. Yeah. I see a few questions in, in the chat. Should I just go down yeah. the list? Yeah, and, uh... we can do that. All right, so we have a question about uh, kombucha and diabetes. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, I, I am not a medical professional, so I will reserve my, my comment. I think in general, uh, we, we, have, we have to remember that kombucha is fermented from sugar, right? Uh, the fermentation reduces the sugar levels, but you can still expect some residual sugars uh, present in the beverage. Uh, so, you know, if, if whether or not, you know, someone can take that level of sugar, that, that really depends on, on you know, uh, on themselves, on, on their bodies, and, you know, with advice from their medical uh, professional. Yeah. So there's another question of, yes. Yeah, I, I was just just a quick follow up on this. I wonder if there is a so like in, in so far as kombucha is concerned, I've heard that the alcoholic content is up to zero point five percent. I can't remember the context in which I've heard that, but that has been kind of what I understood it to be. I wonder if there is also kind of like a range that we uh, might know of, like when you ferment, when you make kombucha, right? Uh, and I have left kombucha until it's totally exceeding, it's impossible to take it. Um, but then like when you hit that sweet spot, that in between, of course it's personal preference, but is there, um, do you have a sense of what that sugar breakdown content might have been? Is it like 5% left of the sugar digested, like the rest is digested or? So that, so that really, that, uh, it's, quite, it's quite hard to answer, you know, um, off the cuff like this because it really, really, really depends on, on how you ferment it. So different brewers uh, who ferment it differently uh, would definitely yield different results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I cannot say how other brewers do it. Uh, but if you know, if you look at um, commercial kombuchas, uh, some of them have nutritional labels. And so that can give you an idea of, of mm -hmm. how much sugar is left uh, in, in the product. Yeah. Okay. But you can expect it to be, you can expect it to be, of course, you expect it to be less than the initial amount of sugar. Uh, but how much less really depends on, on the brewer. Uh, I, I've tracked some kombuchas that are just too sweet, so you know, it's not fermented at all. Um, so I've tracked some kombuchas that's you know, purely, purely balanced because it's all acid, 
not nothing uh nothing interesting there so really depends on, on who's brewing and, and, and how they like to drink it. Uh, in general, I would say that there's, there's no right or wrong. It really depends on, on how you like it. Um, for me, I, I prefer my kombucha to be, you know, a sweet, sour balance. I, I think that's more interesting as, as a, a food product. Yeah. Cool. And do you do second secondary fermentation for flavors and stuff? Uh, no. Um, because... So wh why I like kombucha and why, why I like fermentation is because, you know, I think it's a very interesting way of generating uh, novel flavors and aromas. All right, so I can share a bit about my story. So, you know, my, my first ever ferment was this uh, very casual uh, red cabbage sauerkraut. All right, so, you know, one day after work, I, I stayed back, I went to the supermarket, I bought, you know, half a head of, of red cabbage. I just chopped it up, um, threw in some salt. I think it was about a 3% brine. Um, and, and from that very simple, you know, process, uh, the red cabbage fermented. So, you, you know, you got a very, obviously you get, you know, uh, an acidic tang to it. But what was interesting, and I think what really drew me into fermentation was an, an accompanying, you know, black carbon, uh, berry aroma, uh, that came from the sauerkraut. Uh, so that, that was, that was interesting, right? Because, you know, black currant and, and cabbage are on two ends of, of the flavor sphere section, right? You have, you have vegetal, greenish, sulfur mm -hmm. on, on one hand, and you have, you know, tangy, acidic berries on another. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, uh, and it was clear to me that, that red cabbage, that, that, sorry, that, that black currant flavor came from fermentation because I didn't add anything else, right? It was just red cabbage, salt, water. Uh, so yeah, so I think you know, if fermentation is it, it, is that uh, magical, so to speak, uh, and you can get such you know such such crazy results. I wanted, I told myself that you know when I brew kombucha, I'll, I'll keep it as is. So I don't add fruits, I don't add any spices to it, um, and the the idea is that we're going to showcase the flavors that arise from fermentation because I think that is more mm -hmm. interesting, that's more nuanced. Uh, so this is very similar to you know if you buy uh, specialty coffee uh, or if you get like a good bottle of wine you get certain, certain flavors from the wine you get certain, certain flavors from the coffee so those come in those flavors come about because of how the wine is made how the coffee is processed how the coffee is brewed uh, those flavors are ideally not just thrown in right so because of that it's, it's more interesting it's more complex um, I think that tells a bit more of a, of a story of, of how uh, of, of, of the journey of, of that food product. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, I, no, I don't add fruits and flavors. I just add, uh, I just let it rest in, in the bottle so it can cover it. And I think that makes it, you know, uh, interesting texturally when we have like little fine bubbles uh, and that lets fermentation tell its story. Yeah. Nice. So we have another question on uh, nutritional value of fermented products? Is it lesser than the fresh ones or is it the same as cooked food? Um, is there anything that's lost in the process of the fermentation? Yeah, uh, that, that's a very good question. So, of course, again, it depends on what you're fermenting. Uh, I would be very cautious to, you know, issue a blanket statement to say that, you know, all fermented products are more nutritious than mm -hmm. non-fermented products. Um, so you, one, it really depends on, on what you're fermenting. Uh, two, sometimes yes. Uh, so we, we do have cases, um, if you look at uh, certain grains or greens or legumes. So for example, classic example, soybean. So we know that soybean has certain uh, chemicals that can inhibit the, the body's ability to absorb other nutrients. So, you know, we call them anti-nutrients, right? Uh, saponins, uh, oxalic acid, and, and polyphenols, so, so on and so forth. Uh, tempeh fermentation, for example, can reduce these anti-nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a way, that allows the body to absorb more nutrients. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in a way, so you can say that for that, for that specific case, yes, it may be more nutritious uh, than raw or, or 
uh, than raw soybean. Yeah. Uh, but it really depends on, on how it's processed. And it really depends on, on how it's prepared. So if, if, I, if I make a, a nice tempeh, but you know, if I add uh, a lot of sugar, a lot of salt, a lot of fat to it, is it, exactly, is it really more nutritious? Um, I'm not too sure. So it really, really, really depends on, on, on how it's made. Uh, I, would, I would hesitate to, to issue a blanket statement. Uh, but you know, in general, I think you know, as long as you eat in moderation, uh, you will do fine. Uh, we, we do know that fermentation can improve uh, certain vitamin levels in, in food products. So like kombucha has higher levels of B6, B12 because it's fermented, just because it's fermented. Um, but for you know anything else, any other like pharma, pharmaceutical or, or, or medical uh, applications, those are less well studied. Uh, and so I cannot say for sure. Mm-hmm. Right. Cool. So um, the follow-up questions from Anna is also, is fermented food equal to preserved food or processed food? Uh, that, that's also quite, quite interesting. So um, we can look at the, the history of, of fermentation. So we, you know, we, we can quite easily imagine how, I mean, historically, how fermentation came about. Right, uh, probably someone someone a long long time ago decided to you know uh, try and pack the surplus harvest, uh, keep them under under frost, you know, to, to preserve them uh, so that they could they could eat them over winter. Uh, they, they figured they, they could add salt to it, inhibit spoilage, uh, and and that could have uh, encouraged fermentation. Uh, so in a way. Fermentation is a subset of food preservation, right? So you, you, you can preserve food by fermenting it. Uh, and you know, broadly speaking, any, any doing anything to food is essentially processing it. Uh, but realistically, in industry, uh, food, processed food has, 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 has certain um, technical requirements. Uh, so, in in, the, in that sense, uh, fermented food isn't necessarily processed. Yeah. So you, you can imagine processed food to be you know things like your your corned beef, your uh, fish balls, fish paste, bunch of meat, spam, uh, what have you. Uh, so so it's a different style of of food preservation. Yeah. Right. So I guess maybe it's more, um, it's more a question on uh, terminology, right? Because in, in the food industry, when we think of processed food is, you know, like your uh, spam and your, uh, maybe your instant noodles and stuff like that. Chicken nuggets. Fresh, before, yeah. yeah, chicken nuggets and all that. But then when we talk about fermentation in this context, we are talking about, um, uh, processing fresh food um, and I think that it's also I I think what I really appreciate about fermentation is the capturing of uh, the natural elements that actually goes into the food and also the element of time right how time plays a role in that yeah so I think it's it's quite different and the intention is also quite different we have another question from YC. Will fermented food expire to the point that it is no longer safe to consume? Uh, he has an um, open sour crow which is already expired. Is it still safe to eat? Has it exploded yet? <laughs> so the, the, the challenge here is, is that, uh, and you may have heard me repeat this, these two words uh, over the past few minutes already, it's, it depends. Uh, and I say that because it depends on what the manufacturers intend. It depends on what the manufacturer, on how the manufacturer has, has prepared that, you know, that jar of sauerkraut. How so? Uh, realistically, if, if you make your own sauerkraut, there is no expiration date, right? There is no spoilage date. It doesn't really spoil. Uh, what can happen, however, is that, you know, your sauerkraut may over ferment. So it may be, it may become too acidic, it may become too too mushy. So you lose its its textural 
uh, uh, aspect of it. And at that point in time, the manufacturer can say, look, uh, when it passes this point, you know, I no longer want this quality to be associated with my product. Right. And, th and therefore they stick a best before date on it. Right. So even though it's, it's safe to eat, the quality may not be, be ideal. The quality may not be in line with the manufacturer's intention. So in that sense, yes, it's safe, even though it, it has expired. Uh, of course, it really depends on how, on how it's, it's made, right? If the manufacturer has added certain things to it, um, it could have expired and it may be in a way that it's no longer safe, uh, you know, because uh, perhaps of, of oxygen going in or, or what have you. So it depends. I hate saying it, but it depends. Yeah, I, I feel like this also brings us back to what you have said initially about how fermentation is really something that can be accessible to um, most people, right? Uh, and how do you gauge, right? It's not like we're going to uh, lab test all our kombucha or whatever we attempt to ferment, but how do we uh, get in touch with or trust our intuition, trust our sense of smell, trust our sense of taste, and and you know without going into the complexity of why do we even have like expiration dates on so many food products right uh, for commercial reasons or whatever um liability issues but it's also like i think um yeah i mean i have just eaten cake made from flour that's uh expired for more than a few years and i'm this is last week and i'm still okay <laughs> no no food poisoning or anything so i think it's really coming back to like you know when you taste it or when you open it uh what is that thing telling you right how do you read it like with your sense of smell and you know your own um, ability to make that assessment yeah so and that's something that, that, that we have been trying to to teach as well right like how do you I think, I think, you know, if, if you give anything to someone uh, and if they are an experienced cook, they can, you know, look at sauce, look at salt, and they can, they can assess it, right? If your, if your sauce, if your sauce smells as intended, if it tastes as intended, it's generally okay. If you don't see anything weird growing, it's probably okay. Uh, but when it comes to fermentation, I can see why people are not, not as familiar with it as they are with, you know, cooking rice, frying an egg, for example. Um, and, and, that, and that's why we, we really, really take our time to, to explain that. Um, we also see that, you know, uh, one person's spoiled food is another person's fermented food, right? So th there is also a bit of that cultural, um, societal experience that, that comes into it, right? So to someone you may see, oh, it's, you know, it's mushy, it's, it's sour, soybeans. Someone else may see, oh, that's, you know, that's very similar to, to, to natto, right? Um, or, you know, your Chinese fermented bean curd um, smells awful to, to some of us, but it's a delicacy in, in, in some areas. Um, yeah, so, you know, even just like, we, we, spoke, we spoke about this example earlier, tempeh. Uh, you know, over-fermented tempeh smells, to, to me, it's, it, it, it has a very uh, pungent smell. Uh, it's, it's quite acquired, it's not for everyone, uh, which is, which is a, exactly why it's you know, regarded as a, as a delicacy in certain areas. Uh, so to me, over-fermented tempeh may be spoiled, but to someone else, it could be you know, perfect, lovely fried. Um, so yeah, it, 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 again, it, it really depends. And I think what we what try to teach is to, you know, for people, what we try to encourage is for, is for people to, to widen their palate, uh, so to speak. Right. So if you, if you are more familiar with different cultures, with different uh, food ingredients, with different food preparation methods, uh, that sort of uh, equip, better equips you to, to you know, tackle these, these problems and, and answer these questions. Um, and again, we, we, I go back to, the, to this community that we're, that we're trying to, to grow because I think you know, that really helps because, because then you can really rely on the, the collective experience of, of a, a whole group. No, rather, rather than try to feel that you are you know one person you know in this vast ocean of knowledge and, and trying to figure out you know where is where and, and how to get to where you want yeah mm -hmm. I, and I think this is this is also quite important when we, when we look at um, fermentation as a way of you know using up food waste 
So we look at food waste valorization. Uh, this is something that we've been trying to to, uh, to incorporate at the brewery as well. Um, no, but in general, in, in the home kitchen, it's quite straightforward, right? So if you have vegetables that uh, that you think are no longer as fresh, or they may be you know blemished in certain ways, uh, fermentation is one easy way to sort of restore value to that, right? So if it's a blemish, you can cut away the blemish. Uh, you can cut up the rest of the vegetables, throw some salt in. It becomes a very quick pickle. It becomes a very quick, um, you know, kimchi or, or acha. Uh, uh, if you have, you know, fruit scrapes, you can ferment that further into the kombucha. You can ferment that further into beer or cider or wine or vinegar. Um, so these these are techniques that we think um, don't amount to much, but can help. The, the, the average household reduce their overall, the total level of, of food waste. Um, or at least we think helps you find value in, in food waste, right? So you're not just throwing away, you are extracting as much value as you can out of it before you finally discard it or, or throw it into your compost bin um, and, and you know, reuse, reuse it, yeah. So we have another question from YC. Is it legal to ferment food in Singapore, let's say to make our own wine? And I heard that it could be dangerous if it is not done properly. Um, it's a legal question, I guess. Is it legal yeah, so, to ferment? <laughs> uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it is okay to make beer up to 23 liters a month. Uh, and you know, if it's strictly for personal consumption, so you're not, you're not selling, you're not retailing, uh, it's it's okay to make beer within certain limits. Uh, if done correctly, it's quite safe. Uh, you won't really, I, ha I haven't seen people really get too sick from it. You know, maybe an upset stomach is, is as far as you'll go. Uh, beer, wines, I would classify, you know, roughly similar. Uh, the, 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 so in my experience, the, the main danger comes in distillation. So distillation is completely illegal uh, without a license. Because mm -hmm. in distillation, you are, you are concentrating certain, certain uh, compounds in, in your beer and your wines. Uh, and if you do it wrongly, you end up concentrating certain toxins or poisons. So of course, that is, that's, that to, to me, that, that's a clear, uh, clear hazard. But beer fermentation, wine fermentation, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, again, as, as we teach, if you, if you use, you know, the knowledge that you're equipped with to, to assess the safety of it, uh, you should generally do okay. Uh, this is a nice segue to the earlier question I have, actually. So I, before you came on, I was sharing uh, my experience with uh, fermenting uh, bananas in my farm in Chiang Mai because there will be times when I have, like, so much bananas I'm sick of eating them raw, having them as smoothies, which I totally love and, you know, uh, baking with them. But um, so I started from making a banana syrup and then ba banana vinegar, which I love and have accidentally made a banana whiskey. <laughs> so I, to this day, it's only through speculation that I think like, mm, what happened with that batch? How come it became alcoholic? So maybe you can shed some light from your scientific background, uh, you know, what happened there? What might have happened there? <laughs> so in, in general, and this is something that we see, you know, in our beer, in our wines, in, in kombucha, uh, when something ferments and it's not exposed to air, it tends to turn alcoholic but when you expose it to air then it turns vinegar turns into vinegar uh, so yeah so you know just by controlling um, air exposure air exchange you can control whether something becomes alcoholic or, or acidic mm. uh, so, so that seems to be uh, that to me would be what I imagine to be to be what happened yeah okay so my own speculation Maybe the um, banana that I used to uh, ferment that actually turned into alcohol was already starting to ferment uh, on its own. That means it's a little bit overripe. Um, 
do you think that could be a possibility? Because I can't really speak to the air thing because I think I did exactly the same, like the same type of jazz. So yeah, I'm not sure how that might be a possibility, like the sugar content, the ferment, the state of ripeness of the fruit itself. Would that have made a difference? I mean, I think bananas are a very interesting ingredient uh, because you know, if, if, you, if you track uh, the, the sugar levels in the banana, we, we know that you know, the green banana has lower sugars, it's, it's quite starchy, uh, which interestingly enough makes it um, a, a healthier product because you know, it's, it's a fermentable sugar that, that doesn't add calories to your diet. Uh, and and then as it as it ripens, you know th those starches are broken down to sugars, which is why you know ripe banana tastes very sweet to us. Uh, yeah, so in in a way, if if you know you have certain yeast, you have certain compounds um, that are already starting to grow on on your overripe banana, that could um, shift that uh, that needle, uh, point it more towards towards alcohol. So the 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 whole you know my rate of, of different different factors that uh, go into affecting fermentation. Uh, so over the brewery, we try to be a bit more uh, scientific about our approach. We try to be a bit more uh, controlled. So if we are changing a variable, we want to make sure that we, we try to keep everything else constant and, and, and then that lets us you know, keep track of, of, of what we are doing and, and how we can cause something to change. Uh, so right now, you know, I have a, a Ginger homemade ginger ale fermenting. I've got a pineapple cider fermenting. So uh, I've uh, I've also I have a bread beer bread ale fermenting. Uh, so yeah, so we have a couple of different things that 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 are going on, and then we always have to make sure that we always have, we always have to pay attention because uh, different ferments require different conditions, okay. um, and then we just have to make sure that you know we want to. Uh, fermentation, fermentation is quite interesting because it's it's really like dealing with with a living being, right? So it's not as as mechanical sometimes where it's you know one plus one, you know it's it's not like Lego blocks where you can force things to click. Uh, for a living being, you know you have to coax it, you have to persuade it, uh, and then it will do your bidding. Yeah. So so that's that's uh. Fermentation. So, and of course, sometimes you, you do get uh, the occasional you know wrench into your system. Something crazy comes up, uh, and it could be good. It could be you know it could be a, ha a happy accident, or it could you know ruin an entire batch. And then you just have to to, to work with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a, a little quirky question. Do you talk to your fermented ferments? Do you talk to your <laughs> ferments while they are sitting there <laughs> doing their work, being activated. <laughs> No, no, I mean... Okay. Because <laughs> you're saying that you have to coax them and you have to persuade them. I'm just wondering, like, you know, how does that look like? <laughs> we, 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 we coax them using science. We coax them using, <laughs> you know, sugar levels. We, we feed them. We make sure that, that they are, you know, comfortable, not too warm, not too cold. Um, we introduce air where we need to. Uh, we take off oxygen where we, where we don't need to, you know. Uh, yeah, so so we, we coax and, and persuade them in scientifically appropriate manners, yes. <laughs> so you mean, so you actually would use like certain uh, tools to measure, like how would you know, like, you know, that whether they're feeling oh, it's too warm or whether they need more air, uh, like how are they talking to you, maybe the question is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, a lot of it comes to, to experience. Um, so the, uh, you know, a, a good brewer can, can look at the brew, can, can smell it, and there are certain telltale chemicals that uh, clue you in to how a brew is doing. Right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if I smell something and I smell you know, nail polish remover, that tells me that my fermentation is, is still quite uh, raw, it's, it's not mature yet. Right? So um, if I smell uh, green apples, I know that you know, I get, I'm getting a bit of fruit, I'm getting quite a lot of yeast activity, um, if I smell butter, that tells me something else that's happening. Um, if I smell vinegar, that, that's probably, a, depending on what you're fermenting in, in kombucha, it, it's typically a good sign. Uh, so yeah, so it, you know, we, we can smell, we, we can taste, we can look for certain tasting notes, 
uh, that will tell us about how how the so, the so that is basically how the brew talks to us. Yeah. Okay. If you want, if you want, you can sort of like hear for bubbles. So, so that again tells you yeah. um, the activity, right? Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's quite interesting, interesting, you know, um, thing to, to to work with. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess um, what I'm hearing you say is that um, the scientific method is still very much uh, embodied um, like senses that you're using, right? <laughs> Listening to it, smelling it, right? It's not like you use like a refractometer or something to measure. So, so that's uh, interesting because I, I've gotten quite a few questions about, about, the, about the refractometer and I, I, and I have seen it used wrongly as well, which, which, which gets to me a bit. Um, because again, the refractometer only measures what the instrument is designed to measure. Right? Some people like to tag more meaning to numbers than they have. So you know, again, just be very careful about asking the right questions and designing um, the right experiments, designing the right methods to, to ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate that you're taking on a more like uh, human and holistic approach to to this uh, interaction with the ferments, and it's not like you know just the numbers and yeah. you know it, that, think, that how limiting that could be as well. Yeah, and I think I think we we have we have found that you know numbers are great; they they make it easier to to standardize certain procedures sometimes. Uh, but we also know that the numbers mm -hmm. don't tell the full story, right? So at the end of the day, if it's something that's designed mm. for you know, human consumption, then the then it's best to be assessed by the human palate. Right? Then you mm. then you can smell things that maybe numbers cannot cannot give you the full picture for. You can taste things that may not be reflected uh in, in those measurements. Uh so yeah, so what what we do try to measure, uh we do try to to dial in those numbers. We always want to you know, remind ourselves that you know at the end of the day we, we have to test, you know, like we have to use our palette to, to, to be that final um, assessor. Mm -hmm. So we have a few questions coming through the chat as well. Uh, YC is asking, is the microbiome in our urban, does the microbiome in our urban setting affect the quality of making a starter culture here? As opposed to in a village of remote location, I guess maybe that's in reference to my remote <laughs> village where I was... Uh, doing a starter culture for making the uh, fermented tofu with uh, rice, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, very quickly, uh, yes. Um, so obviously the, the, the entire ecology, the, the, the microecology is, is quite, it's quite different, right? So, you know, uh, people in industry always talk about that. San Francisco sourdough because they say that you know the, the sourdough, uh, the, the micro ecology over 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 in, in SF is is just more that just produces a sourdough that that that, that tastes better. Right? So obviously if you, if you try to, to re replicate that here, you find that you know you won't get the same uh, results. All that depends on the level, the the the, the climate, the microclimate. Uh, of your home, your, your kitchen, your bakery. Uh, so yeah, so all, all of that can, can change um, how something ferments. Uh, yeah, so I mean, th that's why in my, you know, in my, my CNA interview, I, I talked a bit about, uh, I echoed what uh, Chef David Cheng said about, you know, terroir, when we talk about like micro terroir, right? Uh, so we, we understand terroir as, you know, the, large portion of land, you know, like a vineyard or, uh, you know, a, a plantation of, of olive trees or acorns. Uh, but, you know, when we look at microbiology, when we look at fermentation, that microclimate matters as well. How, how warm a particular shelf on your kitchen is, um, how cold a particular corner on, on the floor of your, of your room is, that can affect the way certain things ferment. Yeah. So you know, like recently, if we have, we have that we have this streak of of you know, rainy days, uh, this this increase in humidity, this drop in temperature will also affect the ways uh you know, things are fermenting over the brewery. 
and I suppose the quality or the type of uh, ingredients that you would use would also make a difference. Like, you know, like water quality, the sugar, what type of sugar you would use, um, and whether the soybean is GMO, GM soybean or not. Uh, yeah, just throwing some of these variables in, like how much uh, do you pay attention to these things, like the source of the ingredients, let's say. I think, you know, provenance is, is, is um, important, of course. Uh, but for the home cook, for the home fermenter, I would say don't have to think so much. Right. <laughs> so I, th I think at the end of the day, fermentation should, to, to me at least, you know, it should be a very natural process. Right. If you have to jump through multiple hoops to source the right tofu, the right banana, uh, the right honey, the right sugar, I think that defeats the purpose of, of you know, have, making it fun and enjoyable and, and accessible. Um, also, I uh, always tell people to you know we should try to, to look local, to look regional for ingredients. Again, if you're importing things from from all across the world, um, that uh, in a very straightforward manner increases the carbon footprint of your ferment, which I think is not necessary for a for a successful ferment, right? Uh, uh, I always tell my friends, you know, the 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 the, the mark of a good cook, of a good chef you know, isn't in how they can source for highly rare, uh, highly priced ingredients. It's how they can make the best of readily accessible uh, material, right? Uh, so, for example, in, in you know, in, in just, in, just in kombucha, right? I can, of course, I can source for highly priced teas, expensive teas, um, and I will make, I could make a good drink out of it. But, What's my value add? My value add comes in my sourcing and my supplying, right? Uh, but if I can take, you know, affordable material, affordable ingredients, and turn it into something that that tastes like premium, then I think that value add shows, you know, the the the, the technique and and uh, the process of, of fermentation. Yeah. Yeah. So I I appreciate that approach, but I wonder if you want to add to uh, Nicolette's question, do better quality ingredients necessarily make better ferments? Let's say if you have, you know, you, you have a fairy godmother that has a garden that, you know, can whip up whatever uh, ingredients you want. And so it is available. Does that actually make a difference? I don't think I've, I've, I've used extraordinarily premium ingredients to ferment. I think, um, you know, when, when we look at, at, at uh, terroir, we also look at what is, is available in the region, right? So, you know, it makes sense that if you're fermenting something for this you know, climate, you would choose ingredients that, uh, you choose a fermented that, that works here, right? It, for example, it, it may not be, uh, be very practical to ferment a, to try and ferment a lager. So a lager, uh, a, a lager ferments at about 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. Mm. So in Singapore, it's obviously not feasible unless you have a, a, a huge fridge, right? Uh, like a water jacket to cool. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I will try and ferment things that, that, uh, more organically for many in these temperatures. Uh, so again, when, when I look at sourcing, I try to source ingredients that uh, are readily available here. Uh, so they, they may be good ingredients, uh, but I don't necessarily think that it's, it's required. So the short answer is no, not necessarily, uh, but it probably depends on, on what you're fermenting. So again, we want to, we want to make sure that you know, it's, fermentation is very accessible. Right, so you know, if you are dealing with vegetable trimmings, if you're dealing with uh, less fresh ingredients, you know, you can always turn it into a, a quick ferment, always turn it into a half sour pickle, um, and you don't need to fuss about choosing, you know, premium cucumbers, premium cabbage. Um, I think I think they all work 
fine. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So we have a very interesting question from Wendy. Uh, is there such a thing as safe distancing? If you are fermenting kombucha, water kefir, milk kefir, sourdough, all at the same time, do you need to keep them apart? I guess that's <laughs> the question. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what, we, what I found is that uh, you don't actually need uh, or rather, I should, I, should, I, should, I should phrase it uh, in the converse. You just have to pay attention to, you know, hygiene and sanitation. So obviously, when you move from ferment to ferment, you know, you wash your hands, uh, you, you clean your equipment, you sanitize your equipment. Um, yeah, uh, if, if you do those, you should be all right. So I, I have my beer next to my rice wine, next to my kombucha, next to my miso, next to my vinegar, and they all seem quite happy. Uh, so, yeah, so as long as you know, everything is clean, you, 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 should, you should be alright. Um, Wendy, has your question been answered? I wonder if you have a follow-up question to that. No? Okay. So, um, yeah, so we have one question here from Yen Ha. For laymen like me, how can I ensure that the fermented food is safe for consumption. Oh, okay. We'll come back to you, Wendy. Yeah, so it, again, uh, without knowledge of the fermented product itself, it's quite hard to say for sure, right? Um, in general, if you are fermenting something that is not supposed to be moldy, if it looks moldy, that's bad, right? Uh, if you're fermenting something that's moldy, if it's moldy, that is probably expected. Right, so it, it really, really depends. I hate saying it. It really, really depends on what you're fermenting. Like, temp if tempeh is moldy, it's good. If kimchi is moldy, it's just bad. Right, uh, without knowing what that product is, it is quite tough to say for sure. Um, yeah, so Wendy followed up that she heard that it may cross contaminate. This is about the safe distancing question. Yeah. But yeah. I think you mentioned that as long as you wash your hands and keep proper hygiene, yeah. that should be okay. Yeah, because, um, you know, kombucha, kefir, sourdough, uh, these are not products that aerosolize, you know, so you don't, they don't really, you know, spurt anything out into the air. Uh, so in general, as long as everything is covered, uh, everything is clean, uh, there should not be an issue. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, don't, you don't really need to... to maintain physical distance, but you just need to make sure that, you know, you, you don't take a spoon, you know, dip it in your kombucha jar, lick it, and then dip it into your milk kefir jar. And then obviously that's going to, that's going to wreck everything. Yeah. Could they not uh, cross pollinate or cross fertilize into another? <laughs> I mean, so, so interestingly enough, so that is, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so, I'll let, you in, in, I'll let you in on a secret. So that's actually something that we are experimenting with at the brewery right now. So we're trying to see how we can uh, tap into our microbiology and fermentation expertise to, to cross certain products and see if we can, if see if we can get something that is, that is unique and that is more interesting than you know, either product on their own. Yeah, so um, stay tuned for that one. Are you having a guinea pigs test? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe maybe after phase two is over, we can all you know have a drink together and and, and chit chat. Yeah. Right, that would be cool. Uh, we have a question from Samuel. Have you tried mixing water kefir and milk kefir? Um. That's the secret. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not, it's not a secret. Uh, I have tried water kefir. I'm not a huge fan of it. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Uh, but my water kefir tends to you know, come off very, very, very funky, um, very complex, and doesn't seem like a drink that I would like to drink. Uh, milk kefir though, uh, when you do it right, is perfect, it's crazy, it's amazing. It's like a fizzy, you know, milk soda. Uh, so milk, milk kefir, amazing, water kefir, not quite so yet. Uh, yeah. So, no, so I've not tried mixing the two, no. But maybe, maybe I'll add it to the to-do to list. 
Uh, Kiefer is also a bit, a bit more finicky to handle. Uh, kombucha, very robust. You can brew it, you can forget about it, come back to it, and it's, it's still waiting for you. Uh, Kiefer needs to be pampered yeah. um, every day. Yeah. Uh, so so that is, that, that's quite a hassle. Yeah. yeah. So I thought like um, there's many reasons why you ferment and you briefly touch on like the history of fermentation. So we, we ferment to preserve, uh, we ferment to uh, maybe arrive at certain complexity of uh, flavor and taste. And I also wonder what are the health benefits? You mentioned briefly about, let's say, um, tempeh, right? How it helps to break down the inhibition of the absorption of nutrients. But can you raise other examples or, you know, share a little bit more about, um, yeah, the health benefits of eating fermented food? Does it make it more digestible and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, so while, while I sell, you know, kombucha fermented products, um, as a scientist, I'm always very cautious about making very broad claims of, of, you know, health, uh, medical properties of anything. Um, so again, two favorite words, it depends. Uh, in general, we do know that kombucha has, or rather fermentation has certain benefits. Uh, in general, we can see that, um, you know, it, it can break down certain um, proteins, it can make certain uh, nutrients more bioavailable, more easily digested, more easily absorbed by the body. It can break down certain anti-nutrients, uh, which again, free up uh, nutrients to be absorbed by the body. Uh, we can we, we can see that we can, we can so sometimes enrich certain vitamins, um, B six, B twelve. We can we see that in tempeh, we see that in in kombucha. Uh, what are the health benefits are there? Um, there are studies to 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 look into certain site, uh, certain byproducts of, of fermentation. So some people say that some of these byproducts, some of these acids produced during fermentation can help improve, uh, can help, can, can lead to health, up, good health outcomes. Uh, we are not that sure yet. Yeah, so, so the, the, the jury is still, still out on, on, on those. Um, some people say that, you know, by virtue of eating these microbes, you, you enhance, you enrich your, 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 your gut, uh, your gut health. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite sure about that. Uh, we know in general, uh, in general, uh, a diverse gut, uh, diverse population of gut microbes is correlated with good health. Uh, so if you're healthy, you're likely to have a diverse gut microbe. Uh, but whether they are related, we don't quite know yet. So uh, my advice for anyone is, you know, eat everything in moderation. Yeah, I, I won't eat fermented food to be healthy, but I would say that, you know, fermented food can form part of a healthy diet. I think we have a question about uh, refractometer as well, right? Uh, so this is going to sound a bit technical. In short, a refractometer measures, you know, gives you an optical reading, right? So you, you look through it, um, you know, it, it shines, it allows light to go pass through your sample and you, you take a reading of it. And that is basically uh, the, the reading from, from, from the refractometer. In industry, uh, we typically correlate that reading to the amount of stuff, the amount of compounds, sugar, alcohol inside the sample. Uh, but that is not a. You, 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 we are not directly measuring the amount of sugars or alcohol inside the sample, right? You're just measuring a proxy, a number that is a proxy of that. Uh, so. 
you know, when we see a corresponding change in, in numbers, uh, we tend to say that, oh, it's due to a corresponding change in, corresponding change in sugars, corresponding change in alcohols. Uh, but we always have to remember, you know, we always have to go back to our, our you know, first, our assumptions, right? Uh, that, in some cases, that may simply be not true. There may be other stuff in it that can affect the readings. Uh, uh, or you could be measuring something else entirely uh, that makes that, that renders those numbers um, meaningless. So I, I've, I've heard of people who are measuring um, ABV using the refractometer. So um, it just doesn't quite add up sometimes, yeah. Are there any other follow-up questions? Sorry, uh, ABV, that's alcohol by volume, yeah. I think you're still muted, Vivian. <laughs> Sorry, so... Uh, Welcome back. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> so the alcohol thing reminded me a question I had about the legal question of whether it's legal to uh, ferment alcohol. Is there, like, you said that distillation is definitely not uh, allowed, um, but then uh, fermentation is okay. Um, but I, I wonder if there's, like, a... a, a a range of percentage that you cannot surpass or is there anything like that or not really i think i i'm not, i've not heard any any hard numbers um but i think in general uh i, I think in general if you're not selling it if you're not advertising if you're not marketing it uh and you're, if you're only brewing for personal consumption you should do okay, right? It's quite hard, I mean, for some people anyway, to get through 23 liters of beer in a month, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, so uh, it, 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 I, I don't think that there's a hard number. Um, I think beer fermentation itself uh, has a limiting, has, a, has, a, has, a, has an upper ceiling uh, for, for how high you can, you can bring the alcohol by volume up to. Uh, so yeah. Cool. In general, you should you should be okay. I think you know um, if you're doing some R and D, uh, don't quote me on this, but you should be okay. Uh, but you know, but when you start getting into retail, you start selling it, then it becomes a bit of an issue. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I have seen I have seen some some retailers, some establishments who are selling wines without the necessary licenses. So, hey, who knows? So we have about two more minutes and one last question. What is the fermented food that you enjoyed most so far? Oh, that's, that's, that's tough. That's like asking me to pick a favorite. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, some of the, my, my most fun um, experiments so far have, are the ones that have seen, you know, some commercial um, success. Uh, so I've done a... I've made nata, nata di coco from scratch. Uh, so we do that uh, using by fermenting coconut water. Uh, and that, that was on the, the menu, the dessert menu at uh, Restaurant Labyrinth for a while. So there are a Michelin style restaurant that looks at, that focuses on, on you know, local cuisine. So we wanted to tell a story of, of how nata di coco uh, comes about. Right? Because it's, it's a dessert topping that you don't normally think about. You just eat it. You know, it's a nice texture, but you don't really, you don't always think about how it's made. Uh, so yeah, nata coco, nata coco is fermented. So so you know, when I saw that dish, I thought it was just a very clever way of telling a story and also showcasing uh, the provenance of, of different ingredients. Uh, we have we also have uh, kombucha based cocktails at uh, Gibson Bar. Uh, so those are pretty fun because I think those really have those those, those really shine a light on on kombucha and and have them. Uh, take center stage in terms of flavors, so uh, the the guest, the diner can can drink a, a kombucha cocktail and, and really taste where where the fermentation comes from. So I think I think that you know um, those two two uh, projects are probably my favorite. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for the sharing and everyone for tuning in and your uh, very interesting questions. Is there any last words that you want to leave us with? Oh, Samia uh, asked, can you teach us how to make Nata the Coco next session? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I publish all my, uh, all my materials uh, online uh, on, uh, on the fermentation uh, group. I, I know I, I yeah, and I, and I can put up a, a, a little infographic or a, you know, a document uh, following this, just a, a simple recipe that everyone can follow mm -hmm. uh, to make kombucha or to make kimchi or something. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, if, if you want to learn more, we can always talk about it uh, on Foodscape Collective or on Fermentation Exchange where I, where I curate materials there. Yeah, I'll be happy to, to, to share more. I mean, I've, I mean, I've been dabbling in fermentation for about, for about two years now. Um, it's been quite fun. Uh, never a boring day, I would say. Thank you. Thank you.